If Christ is king, how should the Christian consider the kingdoms of this world? What does the Bible teach us about human authority and what it means to love our neighbors and our enemies? Before we render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, let's know what it means to render unto God what is God's. This is the Biblical Anarchy Podcast, the modern prophetic voice against war and empire. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Biblical Anarchy Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute and part of the Christians for Liberty Network. This week and every week on Biblical Anarchy, we seek to live counterculture to the empire of man and to instead seek the kingdom of God by unpacking what the Bible teaches about government, authority, and human relationships. I am your host, Jacob Winograd. So for today's episode, I wanted to touch on some concepts that I've mentioned here or there that I've covered actually not on this podcast, but I covered on my old podcast, the Daniel 3 podcast. The Daniel 3 podcast, for those who don't know, which I at this point, it's hard for me to track exactly how much of my audience is made up of those who have followed me since I started podcasting and how many are newer since I joined LCI, and I've had, you know, a significant amount of growth in that time. So back on probably like the end of COVID lockdowns around 2020 is when I got into podcasting, and I had started that under the name The Daniel 3 Podcast, and it's rough if you go back and listen to those episodes. I don't know, I, I might be doing one of those typical things where you you judge yourself too harshly. But whether I listen to myself talk in those early episodes or the other thing is partly to blame of why I might have a negative filter or negative lens that I'm viewing this through is that I've lost a significant amount of weight and I can just tell by looking at myself in old videos that <laughs> how much weight I was carrying. Putting that to the side... There's certainly a lot of my old catalog that's still up if you if you look for it, but a lot of it just wasn't of the standard of quality or production that I strive to have today. And also, you know, it's a different format. My old show was always a live show. And as you guys know, I've recently started a live show with LCI, which by the way, if you haven't checked out, you should. That's the LCI Green Room, and I'll have Links for that in the description if you want to go check that out. We've had a lot of great conversations with people there. And that's where I'm having a lot of my long-form conversations. So some people like that. And so I have content that's ranging from an hour to two hours plus, where I have either one-on-one conversations or kind of like group discussions, roundtables of different types with a whole slew of different guests. I mean, I've had Dave Smith on. I've had Spike Cohen on. I've had some interesting kind of like niche guests. I've had Matt Erickson on from the King Pilled podcast, who is Eastern Orthodox. I've had Preston Sprinkle on to talk about his new book, Exiles. A whole bunch of different people, including I had a debate with Jack Lloyd, which that was last week's episode. I kind of talked about that. So I keep bringing it up, but you know, that's what we do, right? We like to plug things and I just, anyway, I brought it up. But anyway... I used to do all of my content in that live format. And as I've been doing this longer, I've kind of realized, well, there's just two different styles of show that I want to do. And, you know, kind of the long form live unedited format doesn't do so well for the things I like to do on this podcast, which are typically to be a little bit more expository, a little bit more focused and the opposite of what the green room is, right? The green room is open and unscripted as the tagline is. And the Biblical Anarchy podcast, although I don't read strictly from a script, at least not usually, it is very closed and and planned out at the very least. All that to say that although I've covered sphere sovereignty and I've covered the doctrine of the lesser magistrate on old shows of mine from the Daniel 3 era, I've not covered those with a lot of intentionality 
on the Biblical Anarchy podcast, other than to bring them up from time to time. And I covered it a little bit in the episode I shared a clip from where I was on David Lilly's show, and I, I kind of give a brief overview of it. And I decided I wanted to do an episode where I talk a little bit about just the broad, maybe like zoomed out overview of how I view what I talk about here on the Biblical Anarchy podcast, and really just the libertarian message as a whole, I think fits well into church tradition and especially into Protestant and Reformed tradition. Now, some of this will be stepping a little bit on the toes of my co-patriots on the Reformed Libertarians podcast, but that's okay. They have certainly covered these topics as well, although they've covered it slightly different way. They're, they're you know, coming from a strict Reformed view, and I think I'm going to bring a particularly, I'm, I am Reformed, but I'm, I'm bringing a slightly different format and context to what I want to talk about. But basically, I want to sort of establish what I think is the through line from the Protestant Reformation to libertarianism. And, and how different doctrines and different trends have played a factor into the development of these ideas and how there's actually a lot of harmony there. And to also explain these concepts a little bit more in depth. And that way, you don't have to go back and, and listen to an old, almost two-hour episode where I covered sphere sovereignty in, in the most longest, drawn-out way possible. Although I'll have a link for that in the show notes if you want to go listen to it. Again, I might be judging myself a little bit too harshly here, but I've developed just like, you know, imagine sports are the same way. And anything anyone does, you know, musicians probably do this when they, they, they listen to old recordings. You you develop your craft and you hone your skills and you, you get to a point where you look back at your your old material and <laughs> you have a certain opinion of it. Anyway, so let's start out. I'm not going to be going in any, I have a particular order I'm going to be doing this in. So I've, I've mentioned sphere sovereignty a lot and I've given some, you know, kind of on the fly, good enough explanations for what it is. But let's dive into this a little bit more here. Sphere sovereignty is a concept that was developed by the Dutch theologian, philosopher, and statesman, Abraham Kuyper. It refers to the idea that different areas of life such as family, business, church and state, or civil governance, are distinct spheres, each with its own responsibilities and authority. So according to this principle, no single sphere should dominate the others, as each one is sovereign in its own right. So that's kind of what it means by sphere sovereignty. Kuiper argued that each sphere of life has its own God-given authority, and that one sphere should not interfere with another except to support when one sphere fails to meet its responsibilities. So this concept emphasizes the importance of diversity and independence among various social institutions, and it has had significant implications for discussions on governance, the role of religion in public life, and the decentralization of authority. Now, you might ask, well, it's all, this all sounds well and good, but is this a biblical doctrine? Is this a biblically-based, biblically-derived philosophy, or is it just a man-made one, and are we trying to do eisegesis rather than exegesis? So, now I would distinguish that sphere sovereignty is not directly exegeted out of the text of the Bible, but that it is informed by the biblical worldview and by sound biblical theology. And there are scriptures that speak to what sphere sovereignty is sort of trying to make a case for. As I said, it was developed by Abraham Kuyper. So it's more of a theological, philosophical framework. And here I want to give you some of these biblical concepts and passages that are going to support the underpinning of the argument for sphere sovereignty. So the first one would be the creation mandate. This would be like Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, 
where you have the command to fill the earth and subdue it, right? Where you could say this is like a, the idea of dominion. And so this implies, through logical deduction, if you're going to fill the earth, subdue it, be fruitful and multiply, if we're called to have dominion, if we're called to be good stewards over the earth, then this is just going to necessarily, through just understanding of human action, of economies, of scale, of, of, of you know, just the, the nature of scarcity, and a scarcity that includes both resources and human labor, that this would suggest that there's a division of labor and governance across the various aspects of the world. And so this would lend credence to the idea and suggest that there are different spheres of human activity that are going to have distinct roles and responsibilities as ordained by God. So think about it this way. Sphere sovereignty is a, using Genesis 1 as sort of a starting point here, is, is sort of the way in which Christian theologians are trying to describe what is normative for Christians as they try to carry out this mandate that was given at the creation. Now, another passage that's going to come into mind, one that we should all be very familiar with, is Romans 13. This passage, of course, teaches that all authority comes from God. And so Romans 13 is often used to argue that different societal institutions like government, of course, have their authority derived from God. And Kuiper extends this to suggest that, you know, it's not just the state that this would apply to, but that all spheres of society have their own God-given authority. And of course, we then need to, and we'll get to this later, ask ourselves what are the implications of authority that is given or delegated by God. The third biblical basis would be the diversity of gifts. This would be like 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul discusses the variety of gifts given by the Holy Spirit to different individuals for the good of the community. And so this can be extended metaphorically to suggest that just as individuals are endowed with different gifts, so too are different spheres endowed with different roles and functions. Like the body of Christ you know, has the head, the feet, and the eyes, and that analogy comes into play. And and so, you know, I've, I've often said that the sort of like free market or libertarian concept of division of labor in the economy is really a dare vision of biblical ideas. And this is also just self-evident in the observation of, of nature and observation of human society. And so this plays into what I was saying in regards to the creation mandate as well. Fourth contention here would be that Jesus's teachings on the kingdom of God would offer a support to the idea of sphere sovereignty. Gospels frequently mention the kingdom of God as a realm where God's rule is perfect and all-encompassing. And this influenced Kuiper's view that all areas of life must recognize God's sovereignty each in its own way. Then the fifth contention, again, I'm, I'm giving you not necessarily arguments that I've made. These are sort of like it's a summary of Kuiper and sort of like Hyperion thought on the matter. They will sometimes use the passage of render unto Caesar as a way to be like, well, look, these are different spheres. And Jesus is talking about the sphere of the state and the sphere of the church and that these are separate. And I'm not super thrilled with that argument because I, I feel like it's, you know, plug, of course, my own episode and coverage of the render unto Caesar passage, but I, I don't think that that passage is really talking about a separation of church and state in the way that it's often being used. Although I would say that even the interpretation that I think is correct would lend itself to the idea that Jesus and Jesus's kingdom and God's kingdom require things of us that we ought not to give to those who are in human positions of authority. So even though I would describe this argument differently than perhaps some traditional reformers would, that passage still can, I think, be a good foundation for making a case for the idea of sphere sovereignty. So again, and these scriptures do not explicitly formulate or teach this. And so what I'm doing here is not strict exegesis, but it's it's kind of building a, a theological rationale for this 
idea and philosophy that we should have distinctiveness and between these different societal spheres, the legitimacy of the idea that there are different societal spheres and that they're each operating under God's overarching authority. I want to hone in a little bit, bring up some more passages and talk about, you know, besides Romans 13 and besides even just governing authority, there are different types of authority. So beyond just the idea of that there's a division of labor, we see that the Bible describes, you know, sort of the normative you know, observations and makes prescriptions even of different types of authority beyond just governing authority. And one thing about sphere sovereignty that I find to be useful is that it's a pushback against what sometimes you will hear or what's taught in public schools and you'll hear in the rhetoric that's kind of pushed by our public institutions that like we are the government, which of course is, I think, not accurate. Rothbard, of course, talks about this in the anatomy of the state and how this is sort of used to control people because you can convince people, you know, of this kind of like delusion that we we are the government. What the government does is us acting as a society. Then you find yourself sort of like post hoc justifying things that you wouldn't normally justify. You find yourself accepting a, you know, ever growing amount of tyranny and government overreach because you've just been conditioned to accept the results of democracy and the results of government. And although that's not the exact argument that the Bible is making with these passages, I think it's just clear that there are spheres of authority that are distinct from governing authority and, you know, spheres of life and, and society that are distinct from the government. And so the, the government doesn't have a right to, you know, tell you how to parent your kid, right? <laughs> If you're harming your kid, I guess like there's a little bit of a, like the role of civil governance is to step in when violence happens, right? So if, except in the case of actual physical violence being done, parental authority over your child is distinct from government authority. And this is something that the government doesn't like. That's why I actually remember in, in high school, there's a little story, a little anecdote here, but I got into a fight in school and my dad came in and I was fighting in self-defense. I didn't pick the fight, but they wanted to suspend me anyway. And because was, this was kind of like the early years of like the no tolerance rules in public schools. And my, my father was basically saying, listen, like, all right, if you want to punish him, that's fine. But don't take him out of school. We'll just give him detention or something. You know, like I'm, I'm his dad. I should have some say in what's going on here. And the vice uh, principal said to my dad, well, you know, Mr. Winograd, what you don't understand is no while your son is here, he's, he's our child. And like, we're his parents. <laughs> and that, of course, set my dad off. And I remember that to this day. And it's one of those like quiet parts out loud moments. But yeah, the idea that, no, we're not all the government. And government is not an overarching sphere that encompasses all of the society, then everything else fits into it. No, these are different. And there's different types of authority, which then would lend credence to the idea of there being different spheres within society that are distinct. So let's talk about church authority first, right? You know, Matthew 16, Jesus speaks to Peter saying, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And there's other passages similar to this. And this passage is traditionally seen as establishing authority within the church. There's Acts chapter 20, Paul instructs the elders of the church at Ephesus, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. And so this emphasizes, you know, the leadership and caretaking roles of church leaders. In fact, church authority is, is to be respected to the point where in Hebrews 13, the, the author tells believers to, quote, obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. And so this underscores the responsibility and the authority of church leaders over their congregations. And so there's more passages, but those are three quick ones that sort of describe the idea of church authority. And so you have the sphere of the church. I think that's biblically 
supported. We have parental authority, which I kind of already alluded to. Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5 are instances of the fifth commandment. Honor your father and mother that your days might be long in the land that the Lord is giving you. Ephesians 6, Paul instructs children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may go well with you. You may enjoy long life on the earth. He also advises fathers not to exacerbate their children, but to bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And then Proverbs 22, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he shall not depart. This proverb and all these passages speak to the authority and the responsibility parents have in shaping the character and the values of their children. And so these passages collectively provide, I think, a scriptural basis for we've done parents, we've done church. We already know there's ones describing governance. I think there we have scripture that supports the idea that authority is structured across various spheres of life, such as church, family, and they have specific roles and they have specific responsibilities. They might interact, but they are distinct. So I want to talk a little bit more about Abraham Kuyper now. So Abraham Kuyper's development of the concept of sphere sovereignty was influenced by a variety of political and personal, historical, cultural factors. Kuyper underwent a personal religious conversion in the early 1870s, which deepened his faith. He was committed to reformed theology. And so this personal revival kind of renewed his perspective on the role of Christianity in public life and influenced his views on the autonomy of various societal spheres under God's sovereignty. And I would say this was sort of a response to growing modernism and secularization, which aren't just problems that exist today. During Kuiper's time, Europe was experiencing significant shifts towards modernism, which often placed religious institutions in opposition to emergent liberal and secular ideologies. So Kuiper's fear of sovereignty was partially a response to these trends, aiming to protect religious and other societal institutions from being overshadowed by an expansive state. The Dutch political and social context obviously plays a role. The Netherlands in the late 19th century was characterized by its pillar pillarization, where society was divided into socio-religious pillars, Protestant, Catholic, secular, socialist, etc. And each pillar had its own schools and newspapers and social organizations. And so this context obviously also likely influenced Kuiper's emphasis on distinct roles and autonomies in different societal spheres. And Kuiper was also deeply influenced by Calvinist theology and by John Calvin's teachings, particularly the ideas about God's sovereignty and the persuasiveness of sin. So Kuiper applied these theological principles to a societal framework, arguing that no human institution could be trusted with absolute power because of human fallibility and sinfulness. In the context of his time, there was also significant state involvement and control over church affairs. So Kuiper, advocating for the autonomy of the church, saw sphere sovereignty as a way to argue that the church should govern itself without undue interference from the state. The global context of colonialism and missions also played a role. Kuiper's views were formed in part by observing how different cultures managed their affairs and maintained their unique societal structures, reinforcing his belief in the importance of distinct governance for different societal spheres. And then, you know, Kuiper was involved in politics and journalism, so not only a theologian, his practical experience in these fields showed him the complexities of governance and communication, affirming his belief that these different domains of life require different types of governance, and that none of these should be dominated by the state or by any one sphere. You know, society is complicated. And so therefore, the best way to organize society and actually what the biblical ideas in terms of how we should organize society according to divine command is for these spheres to operate independently, but under the ultimate sovereignty of God. And so I'm going to read some quotes from Kuiper now. I've kind of been summarizing a lot of what I've read about Kuiper and what I, I know about sphere sovereignty, but we're going to provide some quotes to give some context and some credence to the things I've said. So on his personal religious conviction, a quote from Kuiper here, 
when principles that run against your deepest convictions begin to win the day, the battle is your calling and peace has become sin, you must, at the price of dearest peace, lay your convictions bare before friend and enemy with all fire of your faith. So Kuiper was very much motivated to fight for the faith, to not retreat into society and let the world sort of just walk all over Christians or the church. I've often talked about Kuiperianism and the idea contrasted to two kingdoms theology. It's more of a comprehensive kingdom view and that this views that Christians should not be taking a backseat in the world, rather be actively trying to shape the world around us. On that note, and I've read this quote before on different episodes, and this ties everything together, and it's also critiquing modernism and secularization. Kuiper's most famous quote, there is not one square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. This isn't a quote from Kuiper, but this is an historian, James Bratt, who said that Kuiper was practical and systemized an entire pluralistic worldview that sought to harmonize life's complexities. And so this is actually lends it to the idea of, you know, a, a pluralistic society with what Kuiper viewed. And I think there are some Christian nationalist types who want to take Kuiperian thought and sort of use it as a rallying cry to sort of like bring back Christendom. But I don't think that that would actually be in accordance with Kuiper's views, because I think that while Kuiper would say that the church should take an active role and the church should even criticize the state and, and hold governments accountable, point them to the fact that Christ is king over them. What he would not want is to push for a society in which Christianity was pushed so hard in the public square that it didn't give other people and other worldviews or groups of people, you know, a sort of seat at the table in a way that would exclude them from public life, which anyway, that's, that's my take on Kuiper. There would be some who would disagree with that. But that quote by historian James Bratt, I think he's sort of getting at what I'm getting at there. So I'm not the only one who has that opinion. In terms of Calvinism, Kuiper wrote, quote, Calvinism demands that all life be consecrated to the glory of God and finds in this consecration, its unity and consistency. On state control and church autonomy, quote from Kuiper here, the government exists by the grace of God and the magistrates must serve God the Lord while they rule us. So again, I don't think Kuiper would want a sort of Christian dumb in which the public square becomes Christian to the point where we don't have a pluralistic society, but rather we have one where Christianity is sort of decreed from the magistrate and religious freedoms or other freedoms are restricted or Christian norms are like Sabbath laws or blasphemy laws are legislated from the magistrate. Certainly, we should be holding governments accountable to God's moral laws and decrees, reminding them that they are not the sovereign that God is. So that's a collection of quotes from Kuiper that I think reflect his theological depth, his personal convictions, and his practical political engagement, all which fed into his formulation of sphere sovereignty as a response to the societal challenges of his time. So I have one more quote here I want to read, and this is going to transition me to the, the last thing I want to talk about. So Abraham definitely had a perspective on understanding of the importance of the limitation of power due to human fallibility. And this idea is articulated in several of his works, particularly in his lectures on Calvinism, where he's reflecting on Calvinist theology. So, quote, sin is not accidental, but deeply founded in our nature. Given this condition, we cannot grant the state the power to rule over life beyond its appointed sphere. For as, as this would open the way for tyranny, which by reason of depravity of human nature would lead to unbearable despotism. So again, I think that Kuiper would not want the civil magistrate enforcing things that are not under the authority of the civil magistrate, but that would be matters of church authority. The church, however, does not wield the sword. 
So these are noteful distinctives that, again, I think there's a lot of people that take a little bit of Kuyperianism and, and run with it to the wrong ways and into pathological ends. I want to use that, though, because this was from Kuyper's lectures on Calvinism. Kuyper was influenced, of course, by Calvin, and Calvin himself also wrote on the limitations of government. So John Calvin, in the, his seminal work, The Institutions of Christian Religion, discussed the limitations of government and the nature of political authority. In terms of the role of civil government, Calvin believed that the primary role of government was to foster a peaceful and orderly society, protect the public, and to uphold both divine and human laws. He stressed that the civil magistrate is a servant of God, appointed to execute God's wrath on wrongdoers. And Calvin argued that rulers should not assume that they have absolute power because their authority is delegated by God and bound by his law. And this implies that a ruler's authority has inherent limits, especially when it comes to matter of faith and conscience. And then an important, significant part of Calvin's writings on this matter is the right of resistance. Calvin acknowledged that there are circumstances under which it is permissible to resist or disobey authority. This resistance, however, was tightly uh, circumscribed. He largely placed this responsibility in the hands of lesser magistrates rather than private individuals, suggesting that if a higher ruler becomes tyrannical, it is the duty of the lower-ranking public officials to curb that tyranny. And Calvin insisted that rulers are obligated to govern justly and ethically, adhering to moral principles, not to the personal gain of the rulers. So this idea of the doctrine of the lesser magistrate finds its founding in Calvin. And so I talked about this again on that episode a couple weeks ago on David's show. And again, I think these two go together. So like I've kind of given you a little bit more on Kuiper and sphere sovereignty, but going into reformed Protestant tradition, more broadly speaking, I think sphere sovereignty is also a natural outgrowth and very much in connection with the idea of the doctrine of the lesser magistrate. And I want to talk about that a little bit here too. To talk about that, although Calvin wrote about the the right to resistance and the idea of lesser, the lesser magistrate, this became even more explicitly talked about through a saga that happened in Germany and through what's known as the Magdeburg Confession. So the Magdeburg Confession was drafted in 1550, and it is a significant document in the history of political theology and development of the concept of resistance to tyranny. Give us some background here. The Magdeburg Confession was crafted during a period of intense religious conflict and political upheaval following the Protestant Reformation, which began in 1517, when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. And this act sparked widespread theological debates and led to significant religious and political divisions across Europe leading up to, so here's some of the key events that led up to the confession. There was the Augsburg Interim, this was in 1548. So after the death of Martin Luther in 1546, Emperor Charles V sought to reassert Catholic orthodoxy in the empire. Following his victory over the, and I'm going to butcher this pronunciation, the Schmalkaltic League, a defensive alliance of Protestant territories at the Battle of Moburg in 1547, Charles imposed the Augsburg Interim. And this decree attempted to enforce a return to certain Catholic practices in Protestant territories while acknowledging some Lutheran doctrines. And it was widely resisted by the Protestant cities and principalities who saw it as a violation of their religious freedoms. So we get to Magdeburg. The city of Magdeburg, located in present-day Germany, became a focal point of resistance against the interim. The city refused to accept the Augsburg interim and argued that it infringed upon their religious rights and freedoms. As a result, Magdeburg was put under imperial ban. They were threatened with military action and potential destruction. So the confession itself was penned by a group of Lutheran pastors and theologians. 
who were close associates of Martin Luther, including Nicholas von Amsdorf. This document articulated a theological justification for resisting higher authorities, arguing that when a ruler enforces policies that contravene the word of God, lower magistrates and even citizens have a duty to resist such governance. The Magdeburg Confession is considered one of the first formal documents in Western history to outline a theory of resistance to unjust government based on religious principles, and it laid important groundwork for later political theories about resistance and civil disobedience, including subsequent generations of thinkers. So it's had a long-lasting impact on political thought. The Confession articulates the doctrine of the Letter Magistrate, and I'm going to read from you a quote. If the highest magistrate, who certainly ought to be obeying God rather than men, that's a quote from the Bible right there, from Acts, endeavors to lead us away from obeying the Almighty God, then he is himself resisting the ordinance of God. And it is then not only right, but our bound duty to obey God rather than men, according to the apostolic word, by not allowing ourselves to be led away from the fear of God by the will of man. As you see here, this is very similar to the argument I give and that Greg and Carrie give on the Reformed Libertarians podcast of the right way to interpret Romans 13. It's not descriptive of what all those who find themselves providentially in the positions of authority are decreeing we should do. It's not a description of that they are put there by God and therefore anything they say goes. It is rather that they are prescribed by God in order to be ministers of God. And at any point that they deviate from that prescribed role and are leading people away from the will of God, are leading people or leading themselves in ways that are contrary to what God has put in terms of limitations on them and the limitations of all people, of what is right right and wrong for all people, that they're no longer acting with godly authority anymore. And it would be hard to distinguish them from the mafia or a common criminal or thug. So that was from Article 14 of the Confession discussing the roles and the responsibilities of the lesser magistrate. It asserts that the highest governing authorities that when they command something, the lesser magistrates have not just the right, but the duty to resist and uphold God's higher law. See, it is not whoever is highest in authority that is the one upholding the will of God. It's whoever is upholding God's law who is actually doing what Romans 13 describes. So, Let me try to summarize and draw my argument here to a close. I've given you the overview of Abraham Kuyper, of how he developed fear sovereignty, what influences he had, some quotes from him described what fear sovereignty is, the biblical support for that, the doctrine of the letter magistrate, and the Magdeburg Confession and the history there. So the question I would pose is, it's a leading question, Is there a philosophical through line between the Protestant Reformation, the doctrine of the lesser magistrate, and sphere sovereignty? And I would say yes. And then I would push on that and say or ask, does this mean that the Reformed and Protestant understanding of Romans 13, that the governments are only prescribed to uphold that which is good, not that Christians must submit to governments and whatever they do and describe whatever they do as good. And that when governments seek to enforce anything that is contrary to God's law, it is our, not just a right, but our duty to resist. And I think that's the correct interpretation. Authority is ordained by God, all different types of authority. But this is not a blanket endorsement for all actions of any type of authority, whether that's government, parental, church. Authority that's ordained by God is also necessarily then restricted by God because God does not grant any human unlimited universal authority that only lies with him. And so the purpose of government is only to uphold good and punish wrongdoing as Romans 13 says. And 
their actions should be in accordance with God's standards of justice and righteousness. And when they deviate from that, they go amiss. And I would say that like everything I've described is part of Protestant reformed theology and philosophy and tradition. And the only thing that I'm doing is saying, if we take this consistently, I would say that it's accurate to say that this idea of the lesser magistrate is describing essentially decentralization. If you have a power that is too big, it goes away from God, then what's prescribed is that a lesser magistrate has the right and the duty to resist that. And so I think what is normative biblically is not governance through a monopoly that's enforced upon people, but rather the decentralization of governance, specifically civil governance. And once you get that, you know, tie in other passages, tie in 1 Samuel 8 and the analysis of Israel during the book of Judges and then into 1 Samuel when they ask for a king. And I would say it's accurate to describe that the decentralization of human power and authority is supported by the Bible because the biblical worldview is rooted in the understanding that because of human sinfulness and fallibility, that concentrating too much power in the hands of one person or a single institution, not just can, will lead to corruption and tyranny. This is what Samuel, or this is what God, using Samuel, warned the Israelites was going to happen when they asked for a king. So that is what I think we have to understand. And, and there's so much more that ties into this, right? There's the idea in 1 Samuel 8 that even asking for a king is idolatry. And I think that's the perfect way to draw this to a close is that I think a lot of people will ask for that power, not because they have from first principles built that out from a biblical worldview, but because they are looking for a savior, just like Israel was in 1 Samuel 8. And they rejected God as their king and God as their savior and wanted to be like the other nations and have a king fight their battles for them. But instead, that king ended up being an oppressor and creating all sorts of problems. And I think, like I've made the case before, that the monarchy only made things worse. And so I think the key takeaways here are that how far can this be pushed? Listen, I say you can push it all the way to biblical anarchy. But at the very least, even small L libertarianism, I think, is, as the Libertarian Christian Institute talks about, the most consistent expression of biblical principles relating to human institutions of government and power and law. And I hope that this has been a good overview of these different concepts, these different theological ideas and through lines and the scriptures and histories that have shaped them and that we have inherited, and that I think that we need to understand as we navigate in this ever-growing, secularizing, and fallen world that we live in, that the solutions are only to be found in Christ and his gospel, and that our best move is to decentralize these institutions of civil governance so that they stay out of the way of the church, and the church can do its mission. That's what Kuiper argued, and I happen to think he's right. And that's all I have for you guys today. I appreciate you listening in. As I always say, until I talk to you next week, live at peace, live for Christ. The Biblical Anarchy Podcast is a part of the Christians for Liberty Network, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. If you love this podcast, it helps us reach more with a message of freedom when you rate and review us on your favorite podcast apps and share with others. If you want to support the production of the Biblical Anarchy Podcast, please consider donating to the Libertarian Christian Institute at biblicalanarchypodcast.com, where you can also sign up to receive special announcements and resources related to biblical anarchy. Thanks for tuning in.